Okay, test. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're just testing our audio just to make sure. So if you hear the audio, uh, just let me know here in the chat window. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we now have audio. That's awesome. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. I'm sorry, like I said. Uh, well, of course, you probably didn't hear me. We've been having some audio issues, so now everything is uh, is going to be good to go. And so um, here, just to kind of go back over some of the things that I missed. Sorry about this. Uh, everything's working now. Um, <laughs> we had a signature series for Substance Source, uh, and the we recently released this. These were materials that were created by uh, Daniel Tiger. And so with the concept of this signature series, we wanted to give the artists the freedom to be able to create what they wanted to do based on any theme that they wanted to have. And so, like I said, today our host is Daniel Tiger. Daniel is a master craftsman uh, with many years experience in the video game industry. He is currently lead environment artist at Bungie in Seattle, where he worked on both games in the Destiny series. For Substance Source, Daniel produced a selection of 15 fully procedural ground materials. And they're so detailed that they're virtually indistinguishable from, from scan materials. So today's webinar is going to be Daniel, and he's going to walk us through the creation of one of his materials. Uh, I'll be here. I might ask Daniel a few questions. Also, you guys are all here in the chat. If you have a question, please let me know. I'm going to be monitoring this. And then, uh, you know, I can, you know, we can ask uh, Daniel to kind of, um, you know, dig a little deeper or something like that. And, and if we have a question about it. So finally, without further to do, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, we're having to do uh, Daniel's audio through a phone into the mic to get things to go. So like I said, uh, we're having an adventure here. I'm glad you guys are all along for the ride. Okay, Daniel, so could you, uh, let's, let's get going here. And uh, again, everybody, sorry for all these troubles. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the material we're going to walk through today. We're going to look at some uh, reference first. This is the final render on, uh, on a sphere. Uh, we're going to show the graph. Uh, we're going to step through it and uh, slightly fast pace. We have like 45 minutes, so uh, we might skip on some of the minor details. Uh, we will first look at the reference. We'll look at some of the components that are part of this. There's some grass and pebbles and stuff in here. We're going to see how we build those. And then we're going to see how it's all combined. And then we're going to look at some of the diffuse stuff. So this is the final render. Uh, I'll show you another rendering on here. Just another view of the same. Uh, and this is the graph over here. Let's see. Hey Daniel, for these for that final render, what what did you use for that? Uh, it's all rendered in Marmoset. Okay, cool. So let's look at the reference. So I think this I gathered like you know maybe one or two hundred reference images for this project, and this was one of the more interesting ones I found when I decided to make like a cliff part of this. So. Uh, just looking at this, there's some some larger shapes, uh, bird shit everywhere. Uh, there's mud in here. There's grass overhanging, but we have a really nice like set of bigger shape mixed with smaller shapes. So we're gonna see how uh, how we build some of those out. Uh, I was really interested in like how the grass kind of like hangs over here, so I. Uh, grab some other references so look we're not going to build a bird that's for like eric wiley and those other crazy people uh but you can kind of see here how the grass kind of clumps and hangs over so we're going to look at how to build some of that up so the first step would be let's just scroll back to this one uh, yeah i'll just scrub through the graphs real quick so uh this is where uh, we set up the main shapes over here. We enhance some volume. Uh, we add some noise over in this area. Uh, we start looking at building some of these components over here. And then we generate some masks. And in the end, we combine everything together. So let's start over here. So I divided uh, the shapes into micro and macro shapes. Uh, and if we just scrub up the reference here again real quick, where is it? Oh, here it is. 
did these kind of small chunks of rock. Uh, I went for like a tile sampler with uh, really small like um, square shapes with different colors. And I'm running them through, you know, the same trick as you guys do when you create cracks to generate something like this where we kind of get this, uh, this nice density of small shapes. And if you put a little bit of an angle on these uh, squares, you can start to get something that looks natural. And then I'm generating my macro shapes in the same way, but with bigger shapes. And then in the end, we'll combine them uh, together. Also, I have some bands here, just a simple uh, tile random. Uh, and I will use this to to generate some of this like horizontal cracking that goes through you see like these lines are not perfect all the way down they get interrupted and you get these kind of like uh ledges and stuff from that uh, so the first thing i do here is i'm using this same crystal it has nice like angles and stuff to it just to break up these you know coming from this just to get something a little more natural and I'm warping this just horizontally. I don't want to mess with the shapes vertically uh, for these. Uh, I'm doing the same for those macro shapes. And for my bands, I want to break them up uh, uh, horizontally. So we uh, kill some of the like uh, perfect laser lines. Hey, Daniel, uh, just a uh, yep. couple of questions here as you kind of go through. So uh, one user is asking here, do you like to use more substance graph uh, for blend together uh, or do you just put everything in one substance graph? I guess, are you basically using subgraphs? I guess sometimes I use subgraphs, but I think for this release, it's, it's easier for people to follow if, you know, everything is in the same graph. Uh, it can get kind of confusing when you break it out too much, even even for myself. But it depends on the project. If you're working on a big, big project where you need to share a lot of stuff, like that's totally the way to go. I think uh, if someone looked at the desert materials I did, I broke out the whole uh, diffuse and roughness color options part and just relayed it through all the graphs just to get the same look. So, so in a situation like that, do you have any like custom nodes you make for your workflow and designer? Uh, not really. It's just like the proprietary notes for the most part, but just like in a way that, you know, if I repeat stuff a lot, I just sometimes break them up. But uh, for this graph, everything's pretty straightforward. So there's not much of that in here. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yep. Mm, so moving through, uh, so this is not very useful. Uh, if we, uh, let's see here, we'll add a normal note. So we can actually see what we're doing. Looking at this shape, it's not doing much for us. It's just basically uh, a couple of laser lines. So we need to go in and enhance the volume of this. And here I'm using just uh, one of these pretty simple cell noises, directional warp bit, just to get these shapes to be broken up based on our, uh, whatever you want to call this, your tile layout. But what I'm also doing here is I'm running an edge detect and hooking up to a bevel just so I can get some of these shapes. We can actually see it if we look at the normal like this. And then I'm just enhancing it with the levels node. But essentially we get something like this. It looks pretty terrible on here, but it will look nicely once we uh, combine them all together. Uh, I'm doing the same for the macro shapes essentially. Uh, and they sort of come out like this. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm doing the same for the horizontal bands. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, I'm running it through two different uh, bevel nodes just to get two different thicknesses on this. And then I'm combining those together to get, you know, something that is a little more random, a little more broken up. But moving back to the main graph. So now once we have uh, these perfect noise fests here, you see like, you see some of these lines, and we're going to take care of that with these uh, enhanced bands we have down here. But here, we're essentially just displacing. We're breaking up these perfect 
And if we compare this one to this, you see how it's we're breaking these vertical lines much as like our reference is showing us here. And then we basically combine these two. Uh, I'm also adding, I'm essentially just blending this uh, depth information on top of uh, my macro shapes just to get the, a little bit of a enhanced depth. And I need that for uh, the next operation, which I'm going to do here, which is a height blend. So essentially, wherever that's low, I'm going to get my small uh, micro shapes. And if we look at this result in the normal mode, it's still going to look pretty bad because we have these thin lines, but we're going to take care of that in a sec. So the, the cool thing about this height blend node, it has uh, the height output and it also has the mask output, which is like a binary mask where how these two materials are combined. And here I'm using that to create even more uh, enhanced volumes. I'm running it through edge detect and a bevel and essentially creating this. So we came from this and adding that on there just creates a little more volume. And then I'm adding the, uh, these enhanced bands on top of that shape. And that will give us this. I also ran that through a little slow blur just to break up those, uh, those line a little bit. And then I have uh, my extended uh, carving over here added on top. Like okay, so this, this still looks pretty terrible, but uh, I'm not really worried at this point because we're going to add some warping on here. So I'm using this node that I found somewhere. I don't know who made this. It's some kind of genius. Uh, it's essentially just a... Uh, it's called non-directional warp for whoever uh, wants to take credit for it. Uh, it. Essentially, it's directional warp in all directions. And here I'm using, you know, a positive and negative X and Y, which, you know, it will push shapes off left and right and up and down. But what's cool about it is like your details remain in the same spot where it originally was, but distorted. Because, you know, guys, if you... If you run stuff through a directional warp, it gets sometimes pushed off screen or like it doesn't like end up where uh, it was before. So looking at this and like pushing some detail on it, we start getting something that looks fairly natural. And here I'm just using a cloud too, which is probably my go-to nodes for, for any type of warping. It has this nice, uh, just makes stuff look good. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think the stuff that I didn't like about uh, the shapes at this point is that we are um, the shapes are kind of uniform. Like you see, this thickness here and this thickness is the same, uh, and sideways as well. So I'm using the slope blur node here to. Uh, inflate so if you set this to a positive value and use blur you can kind of see here what it does so it, it minimizes these the uniformity of those shapes and i'm adding just a few like little details on top of here and that's using uh, this black and white spots that i tile And to break up this uh, uniformity even more, um, using the shadow node. So if you look at this shape, and then if you run the shadows on top of this and set the direction, it will essentially create, uh, well, it's essentially like a light, like uh, run shadows on there. So you can see how uh, every overhanging shape kind of gets dark. So I'm using that. I'm uh, inverting it, and then I'm using that to to subtract those shapes. So it, if we go back to our normal real quick and look at that, and then after the shadow is applied, you can see like we're carving off the bottom of some of these rocks. 
is creating a little more uh, a little more variation, a little more interest. Uh, we have this vertical shape, so obviously at this point, like our cliff shape is completely flat in terms of like uh, macro shapes. So I'm, I'm running running this uh, curve based on a gradient, just like some random values here. I'm, I'm cutting it up with the bands. I'm running through auto levels just to, uh, to get more grayscales back. And then we're running it through a blur because it will look weird combining this on top because it has too many like perfect values and sharp values. It will essentially tear our it will tear our height map apart. You know, if we try to use it uh, as displacement. So combining that back on here. So if we look at our normal again, and we'll look at it this way we create some soft like undulation this way but as you also can see like it's introducing all these flat areas which is not really what we want you know and looking at the height map it's essentially pitch black here so we need to do something about that and then uh for taking care of that i'm using the height blend node again i'm taking our main shape uh running it through a safe transform like yeah, flipping my Y so it's upside down and I'm tiling it twice and I'm height blending it in. So if we look at the normal and with our detail added back in, you see it like this filled out all these details. So that's a good way of <coughs> excuse me, getting some detail back in. Hey, Daniel, um, just a, a question like, um, I mean, just looking at what you have so far uh, in your process, you're getting like all these incredible details and stuff like that. So, um, you know, what kind of your thought process with something like this, like, um, I would assume like, oh, you don't have in mind exactly how you're going to do this. Like, is it a matter of you just kind of looking at your reference and then trying to figure out how to make certain shapes? Or I mean, how do you go about coming up with this technique? Uh, exactly. Like, I'm essentially just looking at my reference all the time. I, I look at my reference and see like, uh, or I look at my, uh, my shapes in here and see like, it's, it's too flat because I'm, I'm running with displacement. Obviously I don't think I have displacement on this here. Like when, when after building, you'll see like how you shape, uh, reacts. So I'm, I'm kind of reacting to what I see here based on my reference. So like adding this kind of stuff, I see like, yeah, this, this added a lot of volume, but then, you know, obviously in this instance, like it introduced a bunch of problems that I needed to take care of. So it's just a little bit back and forth, but everything is based on your reference, uh, essentially, if, at least for this kind of project. Yeah, cool, cool. And I think this, this concludes like the first uh, part, which is, uh, you know, the main shapes. So if you guys have questions up until this part, uh, uh, the next segment will be, we'll, we're going to move into uh, how to build out some of these components. Yeah, there was a, another question that came in here. So how long does it take to create a material, uh, you know, working at a studio in Bungie? Like what's, they're just asking, like, what's the process like? I guess it depends on the material. Um, yeah, I guess maybe using this or one for example. In a studio, you're always under time crunch, essentially. So, like, whatever yields the fastest result is better. That's why you know substance is really good because you can like, you know, if you made something like this before, you can combine that. You can you know easily create you know hundreds of permutations. But creating something like this from scratch, uh, uh, you know, there's there's components you can reuse. You made grass elsewhere. You made pebbles elsewhere that you can kind of like kit bash together. Uh, but I think totally from scratch, it's something like 10 hours or something. And then, you know, if you add presentation on top of that, uh, it's a couple of more hours. No, oh, yeah. Do you, um, some, some sort of average, uh, just, uh, yeah, a few more questions. Do you, uh, use a custom layout or like multiple screens or just the standard kind of settings? Just, I guess when you're talking about just working in designer, like, do you usually use like a multiple monitor setup? Yeah, like here from home, I, I have two screens. So I usually, you know, reference on one side and uh, substance on the other. Uh, 
I think usually I break out these two guys on the second screen because I like to maximize my screen real estate in here. Yeah, so another question was, is, is there a need uh, of a dedicated material texture artist in a AAA game production? Uh, I would think so. Otherwise, I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, well. yeah. Another question here was, uh, any useful nodes from source or custom nodes that you find useful or recommend? Um, I guess maybe anything you found on Substance Share, or do, are you creating your own kind of nodes, or do you really just kind of use what's kind of in the box, so to speak? Usually in the box, but there's a couple, I think, the get slope node. Uh, here I'm using this PVR filter as a test, uh, which adds some like RGB noise. I think, yeah, get slope, that's a really good one. Did you get those on Substance Share? Those are from Substance Share, yes. Okay. Uh, there's something else I use that I forget. All right, and then, uh, so just one more question, then you can get moving to the next part. But uh, I was asking, yeah. how, how do you get the height maps to be so smooth, yet so detailed? Uh, what details go into the normals and which into the height? I think when I build my materials, like, I build everything in height. So you just need to keep attention um, uh, at, like, what your height is doing and if you crank up your displacement in here a lot, then you can actually see where it starts tearing your stuff apart. And that's the kind of stuff I try to like work around because uh, for me, like obviously most of my renders and stuff use displacement. So they kind of break down when you start seeing that tearing. Oh yeah. Uh, so you have to constantly look out for it. And then there was another question of someone asking about the get slope node. Could you uh, just explain about what you're using that for? Uh, well, it could be used for many things, uh, but uh, if if people have used uh, World Machine, you know, you 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 pick the slope. So if you want to put a certain detail on the edges of stuff all around here. Or you can use it in conjunction with one of those like shadow nodes if you want like on all the edges of this to have some color. But then you can use the shadow to mask off the bottom parts and then you can select the top parts. But I think it's essentially just like, you know, blue channel of the normal map cranked up and used as a mask. That's what that node is doing. Do you use any uh, uh, photogrammetry? Uh, and I'll use this reference because it's for this kind of stuff. Uh, it's like invaluable resource. I think that's what I'm using. That's why I'm using the get slope in this instance. But we'll see that once we get to this point. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't want to keep you too long here. So um, yeah, you can just continue forward with the next part. Yeah. Let's let's get back to this. Yeah. So the components we're gonna build out or look at is like first we have the mud. Uh, we can we can pause the reference again. So there's a mud over here, stuck between the rocks. Mm, seems like it's, you know, sitting a little bit on top of the shapes for the most part. And I want the grass clumping. And then I guess you can't see it really here, but I imagine there were like pebbles mixed in. And I think those are the main components we have. Oh yeah, we have the roots and the roots are like, uh, the roots from the grass hanging off so we can see here for instance like there's some thin tendril type stuff that hangs off of these so let's look at the mud first so essentially we came from here uh for the mud i'm using kind of the same trick as we used when we were carving the rocks so i'm using the shadow again uh, but i'm flipping it so it's lit from below just to just to catch those uh, top edges and the fall off is pretty nice on these, you know, it's, it's dark where it's a sharp transition. So that works really well for this kind of stuff. Uh, we're inverting it here, uh, running a histogram scan through it just to like really find those areas. And then I guess we can walk through this part as well. So look at this, oh, actually this. So this is where we're coming from. Uh, I'm using this mask uh, with a non-uniform blur, essentially blurring out the top parts, uh, which is essentially like 
averaging out the normals of this shape because we don't want to use the normals of this rock. We want to we want to kill that detail, but we want to keep the overall shape, and then we want to add some details on top of this. Uh, this is the same workflow as you could use for snow or ice on top of a rock. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of correcting of the shape here, like it's no massive difference, but for me at the time it it made a major difference, obviously. And then we're we're uh, piping some like uh, micro detail on top of this. If you guys can see the difference there, not very fancy at all. Like, but the dirt is kind of secondary in this graph. You, you can't see it much. It just shows up a little bit. Yeah, and, it's just subtle enough. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then the, the pebbles are sitting on top of that. So these are probably one of the worst pebbles people have seen, but they are like also secondary. Uh, you don't see them much. They just add a little bit of detail. So there's, there's many better versions of pebbles that people have made, but for this, uh, for this graph or this overall composition, like these are, these are just fine. So I'm starting with this little polygon shape. I set the scale back, uh, just to, for people who is running this in a runtime environment in Unity or Unreal, you know, it could give a little extra speed back. But I think Wes, you can you can talk to that point uh, better than me. Uh, also for noise here, I didn't want to introduce you know an extra you know Perlin noise or something just to slow blur these guys. I'm just using my main shape and blurring it, and then just offsetting the scale. It creates this uh, little weird lump here. Uh, I'm running this shape through like a histogram scan just to tighten up the shape, which I then multiply on top. So you can see like we don't want blurry. We don't like we don't want the rocks to like terminate in a blurry way. We want it to be like kind of sharp or ends. And I'm doing this for my uh, second pebble as well. And then piping these through a tile sampler with uh, yeah 130 and i'm using the ao from from this which i scaled down a lot because we're not really interested in this detail we get from the AO. we essentially just want to pick out these dark pockets here so essentially uh, all these rocks show up or all these pebbles show up like in the crevices between everything and I think by default, it shows up wherever your mask is white, but you can, you can flip that back here. Uh, yeah, mask map invert down here to get it to show up in all the dark areas. Or you could just invert this, it doesn't really matter. Uh, before looking at how this is combined in, we can uh, move up here and look at how these grass and roots are made. Hey, uh, Daniel, uh, another question yep. that's come in. Do you feel, uh, you know, what node would you like to add if you could? Like, do you feel like there's any specific type of node missing or that would be useful to have? Mm, I think recently I've been really into like L systems. So some kind of L system node. So you can create leaves and branches and roots. Mm, uh, I don't know if people know what L systems are, but they can essentially create tree shapes. Oh yeah, yeah. So Wes, you can you can go work on that when we're done with this <laughs> webinar. Well, it wouldn't be me working on it. It would be the uh, it'd be the devs behind the scenes. Yeah, so that would not be me. That would be Nicholas Weirman if he's happens to be listening. Okay, he's he's now accountable. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so looking at this grass. Oh, uh, I forgot to say, like I added these pins so. Whoever's following along in the graph, you can. Is it F two West to fly between the pins? Ah, uh, I don't know to be honest with you. Um, but I think if it's you just two, right click, F2 here. okay, F2, yeah. yeah. You can also get to them just by using the right click menu. I think the or this. Let's go get back here. F two jumps through all these uh, main uh, talking points we have in here. Okay, so we start this little uh, blade of grass with a waveform. I set the scale back. I think you can probably set it down even more, but uh, I guess I was afraid that I, I would lose too much detail here. Uh, we 
we take this shape, we run it through a transform, like flipping it uh, 90 degrees to get this little blade shape. Uh, we run that through a bevel. Uh, we carve that bevel shape or yeah, subtract by 0 0.34. That's extremely important that it's, it can't be 3.5. Everything falls apart. <laughs> And then uh, we're essentially just trying to bend this guy a little bit, give it a little bit of depth. So we're blending some gradients on. Uh, uh, we're warping it, directional warp, uh, by this curve node. Uh, we're using the same curve node for this, but just a different direction. Uh, we're running a slope blur through this just to break up the perfect shape of it. Uh, same thing here, we're tightening up the shape with the histogram, like multiply trick that we you know, looked at before. Uh, here we're just darkening out the base a little bit. So whenever uh, the grass or roots show up, they, they will, you know, tuck in to the rock instead of like poking out. And yeah. Uh, whenever you use uh, something that you intend to shove into a tile sampler, the, the pivot is in the center, so that's why I'm using this transform here to take my uh, straw grass and moving it up. Because uh, I'm using, uh, I'll use this vector map here, so if you look at the grass first. So we have our single blade of grass going in here. And I'm using a thorn shape here, We're running that through a normal, uh, which creates uh, angle vectors. And then I'm using my vector map in here to have this like face away from that single point. We're, uh, we're using the same thorn shape as a mask, because otherwise we'll get grass all over here. So we just want these in the center. Yeah, you could achieve the same thing probably with a uh, circular splatter, radial splatter, whatever it's called. Uh, but essentially, this is the shape we're looking for. Uh, I guess I was a little bit lazy here. I just made one. But if you look at the end result, you can't tell that this is really just one little clump of grass. Uh, for the roots, we're doing something similar. We don't use the vector map. You see this uh, pretty like horrendous shape and unnatural looking shape here. But after the fact, I'm running it through. Uh, uh, vector warp just to you know making it look a little natural and then we run these guys through uh, a tile sampler just to spit them out where, where they need to go and we're generating a mask here based on uh, yeah based on shadows that we uh, crank up the contrast on and these are actually using the same uh, same position, but we're going to combine them in a different, uh, we're going to combine the roots on top of uh, the rocks and then the grass on top of that, just so the roots are always under the grass. We have one more component here, which is the lichen, uh, which I'm actually not uh, combining into the height because it's such a minor detail. You just get like a little bit of edging on these. So I'm actually just like combining them straight into the normal. So if we go back down here, we're going to combine our pebbles and we're going to use the same trick as we did for the mud, essentially. So we're going to, we're going to blur where the pebbles show up first. It's a little bit hard to see because they're so small, but if we compare this view to this view, essentially we've averaged out the normals in these areas by blurring. And then we just uh, add the pebble shape on top of that back end. So it's using the, the macro shape from what's uh, below. And I'm adding using a really low value here, as you can see. And then we're doing the same for the roots. Blur first, you see here, and add the roots on top. And essentially here for the grass, we're doing the same thing again. We're blurring out these areas where the grass needs to go. I'm running uh, another step here just to get a little bit of 
more of a volume where the grass is um taking all my grass i'm running it through a histogram scan just to tighten up the shape and i'm running that whole thing through a, a non-uniform blur so you can see what that does like if you look at the grass mask here it's it's binary right but then we run it through this uh non-uniform blur just to create these lumpy shapes so when we come to this point here this is just a blur based on the grass and then we add the lumps on top you see we kind of get positive shapes so we we kind of add some weight to this and a non-uniform blur has you know it has these sliders for like uh where you can like offset the the shape of the blur and like obviously intensity is like how strong it is but you see the angle here gives it this kind of like a little bit of overhang shape. It's lighter on the top and heavier at the bottom. And then the final step is just to blend the grass detail on top of that shape. So that's kind of how you get, you know, some of these areas where it could be a little bit hard to see. Yeah, you see this stuff kind of hangs over a little bit. I think that concludes like the components part. If you want to take some questions in between before we uh, start looking at the diffuse, there was. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me just look through a couple of these here and see. Uh, would you say is it uh, necessary for an environment artist to know substance designer? Uh, I don't think so. I think most of the work is still you know, 3D based. Uh, I know for a fact that a bungee, you know, most environment artists are building spaces and not really props materials, but that's pretty much how our studio is laid out. But it's, it's definitely good to pick up. I think in the future, like even more stuff will be node based. Personally, I'm, I'm digging into like Houdini as well. So like a lot of lessons you can learn in substance design, you can kind of translate into that workflow. All right. Um, another question was about the, I think your height map. Uh, do you add the grass in the height map? Yeah, the grass is actually part of there. So I think this this is our final height before we start making uh, diffuses. So the grass draws are in there. I guess you can argue they don't need to be in there unless you run like 4K or whatever. Okay. But it looks nice like this. And uh, here's another one. Uh, how did you get how did you get started with Substance Designer? Uh, well, we we were like on the brink of finishing a project, so we had like a little more time to uh, invest in you know learning new software. And I've always been like the shader guy at work, so like it was kind of natural like digging into this. Uh, I actually evaluated Designer like years ago maybe like four years ago. And at that point, it just felt like a stupid shader editor. Part of yeah, my French. Yeah, the French right. people. But I think since then, like there's been a lot of improvements and uh, now it just feels, you know, natural. Now I wish like Houdini was more like this, you know? Oh yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely grown a lot. Uh, especially since like substance designer four when that came on it felt like that was the point where there was a pretty huge paradigm shift yeah well i think the community has been really good as well like you know like the early adopters has really shown people like even like like i thought it was a stupid shader editor and people could still at that point create pretty cool stuff and it's kind of escalated and now you see you know crazy stuff every day it's like oh i didn't think about that use case for it and uh, here's here's just one more before we get moving forward. Uh, how do you ensure the tileability, uh, tiling uh, work uh, as you're adding new details and adding these non-uniform shapes like the grass? Well, yeah, there's there's a couple of different ways. Like you know, uh, I think the, for the most part, I think here I'm just using the standard tiling right on this uh, cylinder shape. But I, I think I used to. I usually run like 1.5 or 175 because then you can see how it uh, how it scales a little bit. Obviously, you have this here in the 2D view. You press space, and you can see like how the shape behaves outside it. 
like staying true to like your reference and the, the size of the shapes like it shouldn't be a problem if you start you know introducing like some big shape or something some big rock in here you can you want to keep the frequency kind of like equal so when when you saw when we defined these these base shapes over here like i could already tell or i had that feeling maybe it's experience or whatever like i could see that this this would work you know uh essentially my base shapes here are pretty much the same shape which will yield kind of a shape that that just works you know if if i would have lowered this to two or or less or something like this would be a problem right because it would be a one giant crack going through the whole thing and that would repeat like crazy if that's i don't know if that's a good answer but no that's 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 great um yeah so i don't uh why don't we just uh yeah just keep pushing forward here and like i said i'll i'll keep monitoring see if we have any more questions coming in yep okay so let's look at the diffuse part i think usually when i start a diffuse it's based on my uh my height and i think a good rule of thumb is to like run your height input through all the levels because if you want to use uh if you want to use your height map as a base for a gradient map, like if it's not a range from zero to one, essentially, like if we look at any of these, uh, that's not a good example. Yeah, if your if your range is like from zero point four to six, you essentially you're just going to use this range. So it's much easier to run it through all the levels because then you use the full range and you can put you know colors all along this line. So that's that's how I always start my uh, uh, my diffuses like height. Uh, I run my base height through uh, AO, and like this is a really strong AO, but I want to get uh, a lot of these dark areas and get some of the pitting in. I wouldn't use this as my AO, but as mixed into the diffuse, it's it's good. Uh, we combine these two together, uh, obviously killing some of the range, uh, but you, you could bring that back later. Uh, I think my go-to node for for stuff is I just like this fractal sum base for some reason, because uh, you can create something very noisy or something um, kind of like this, a little more like uh, macro noise. So we combine that on top of this. Uh, so if we go back to the graph real quick, you can see these black, uh, what do we call these groups or frames? So essentially as I go along and build and add components, I, I gather my masks because I will essentially assemble my diffuse texture the same way as I assembled, you know, my height information. So it's important to be able to find these different masks for your, you know, sub components. So the first part here is to uh, just create some base color for the rock. Uh, uh, there's some dustiness in here. Uh, obviously, you go back to your uh, uh, your reference texture or a reference image. So I grab something, you know, along these lines here uh, to set some base colors. And for our lichen component, if we look at that real quick, uh, it's, a, it's a grunge map essentially with some brush pattern, which means you add this uh, uh, fade top, bottom, and side. And you know, the more you expand this, the more fade you get. And then you run this through a tile generator just to get uh, some spots everywhere because lichen is this kind of like these uh, small, like pad shapes or whatever you want to call them. So that will be the next step here. So like on the rock, we have lichen. And that is, we run that through just some, some random colors. Again, based on the ref, like go to some like, I imagine this being some kind of lichen. Obviously this, uh, I mix this kind of like bird shit color into that as well. So we get a little bit of a speckled look. So now we have the, the rock and the 
lichen combined together because there's no lichen growing on the mud as we'll combine next. And this is what the mud combined and mud is just like, I just use like a bunch of noises. Uh, these two combined together, blend it on and using my mud mask that comes in here. Uh, you can pretty much directly detect this problem. You get this kind of like di binary edge here, but uh, I'm going to take care of that by using the dust dust node. I think it's a painter node or something, but you could use it in here as well. Uh, it's using a normal and an AO input, so we used the AO that we generated here and our uh, base normal. Uh, it, it uses directionality, so if you find that you know you're you want stuff on the, I think now it's like I think that's facing from below or something. If you do a normal invert between here, you can get your dust to be accumulated from the top. So we create this mask and we uh, blend our brown mud color on top of this. So we came from this and we blend our dirt on top of this with that mask. I guess I imagine like, you know, rain hits this mud and the mud like splats upwards to, to hit those edges. But essentially what it's doing here is just killing some of these annoying binary edges. Uh, next step is to uh, get the roots on there. Uh, you see the roots here, but this is with the roots color applied. Uh, it's using some kind of like yeah, curvature and some noise mixed together. The roots color, like some kind of dry grass color. We'll combine on top of this. Uh, this is run through a uh, hue saturation node, which I'm not really using here, but if you guys play around with uh, the wetness amount, essentially it cranks up the saturation and uh, lowers the lightness. So imagine a wet surface, it gets a little bit darker and also gets a little more saturated. So playing around with that, like it affects the, the roughness and this as well. And the final step is to uh, add the grass on top of this. And the grass color is just whatever incoming grass from the tile sampler straight into this color node with some grassy type colors. I'm not running this wetness parameter after this because since grass in itself is not really porous, so it wouldn't it wouldn't like suck up any of the the moisture. So it wouldn't get darker and saturated in my mind. So Daniel, it looks like you're using uh, the gradient map a lot for the colorization stuff. Is that typically yeah. kind of how you'll work? Yeah, that's pretty much standard. Like in some of the more advanced materials, you can use like even more layers, like just piling on those layers with subtle variations. Uh, just makes it, you know, more uh, coherent. You can do more stuff. You can use the get slope or like shadows and angles and, you know, get different colors. You know, some of these cliffs and stuff is, you know, eroded or uh, windswept or there's rain coming from a certain direction. So like you could use that to your advantage to like break up your colors even more. And I think that the next step is here. I'm trying out this uh, PVR. Uh, filter on here. I'm not sure it's doing too much. Uh, I kind of like the, uh, you know, analyzing some of the, the reference and if you really deep, uh, dig deep into, you know, mega scans, what do their like uh, diffuse textures look like? You can see this type of noise because, you know, everything is generated with a camera. There's imperfections and uh, noise in there as well. And that's, we talked about this get slope before. That's where I, I kind of found that. You know, your albedo is supposed to be completely void of uh, lighting information, but with like a subtle curvature mixed with like a one of these slopes, it will get some like darker areas like this, and it just looks looks more real somehow. And then I'm running everything through like a slight sharpening to just tighten up the details a little bit. I think that pretty much concludes the 
the the diffuse. Uh, this is some substance source specific notes. You know, correcting for PBR and additional sliders and stuff for uh, if you want to change colors and that kind of stuff. So those are just kind of part of, um, I guess, what we require for you creating yeah, content exactly. on source. Okay. Yeah, I think it's called like on here. It's like technical parameters. You see all these guys here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, normals are pretty straightforward. I'm pretty much, yeah, since I'm adding uh, normals on the like and after the fact, I'm, I'm generating some normals for the like in here. I'm masking them out where there's no other component on. And then it's normal combining it back on here. Uh, yeah, the AO, I'm. I'm trying to get a little more volume. I, I do this a lot. I guess if you guys have browsed through some of the other signature drop things like the like jungle grass and stuff, like it's hard to get like a realistic AO with just your, your flat AO base. Like, you know, this grass is supposed to sit, you know, however many inches or centimeters on top of the surface. So it needs to create like a little extra drop shadow. So that's what I'm trying to do here with some of these extra uh, nodes to create a little bit of a stronger AO around some of these things. And you're just having to kind of, um, I guess, add, you know, manually kind of add that in yourself, but you're just keeping yeah, in exactly. mind that. Okay. So uh, any... Uh... I'm not sure how successful it is in this instance, but in, in, in that grass, the jungle grass or whatever like that, it's sort of like really critical. If you look at a a scan material of grass it has you know it's like four or five inches of grass right they're they're tall and they create a different type of ao than just like a flat grass material. So i think that's why some of the grass materials you see made in substance they are really like you know uh, golf grass from a green or something you know yeah because it's hard to get that depth So with some of the new nodes that we've added, like Flood Fill and Shape Mapper, um, ha have you been adopting any of these in your current workflow? Does that change anything up? So some of these were like conceived uh, before the Flood Fill node. I think if someone would like to rebuild this graph, I think you can probably do a lot of magic with the Flood Fills, you know, based on this, because it's using basically the same inputs uh, with the Edge Detect. I I've tried it as well. Uh, and it, it should be a pretty good result, but I, I kind of like this workflow because I, I tried it a bunch of times, I, I couldn't get it to look right. It's something about the flood fill where it creates, you know, it requires your edge detect to be, you know, watertight, right? Yeah. And I don't like how much it, it starts separating. If, if, if someone wants to like take another stab at the flood fill, it would be nice if it just works on this input. It could grab this and do the same thing over like pushing the edges apart so much. But that being said, I haven't used it too much. Do you want to start taking some more questions or? Um... Yeah. Do you sure, have... I think I think we're at that point. I think we walked through the whole thing pretty much. Okay. So yeah, what what other questions you guys have? Okay. Uh yeah. So there's a couple in here. Um we'll kind of run through. Uh let's see here. Uh okay, so we just asked the one about the fill and the shape. Um let's see. Uh when when you begin your work, do do you start with height? Uh kind of establish height first and then albedo, then normal and so on? Yeah, I start with uh, I think I have uh, I can show you guys my I have my own note or my own like base set up. Holy shit. Like, this, this is what I always start building from. So everything is just piped through the uh, one main blend node, which allows me to just like, you know, knock one node up like this, and then I can just like, you know, add a blend or whatever on top of this. So I always have like a complete chain like this, but I'm always starting from height pretty much. 
Uh, another question here. Have you considered Unsharp masking the base color, or do you think that uh, that is being too destructive? Uh, was that an Unsharp mask? Yeah, m maybe Unsharping uh, maybe means like, you know, the kind of like the Unsharp mask in Photoshop to do like some sharpening, I guess. Uh, well, I have a sharpen note on here at the end. I think that's the only sharpening I'm doing in here. And uh, so another question, uh, do you test your material uh, in the process, like as you're working, do you like, I guess, export some things over to Marmoset or do you just do that in the final render? It reacts and how it shows up in your final context is, you know, the most important, right? If you intend this on, a huge cliff and you sit here and like you're worried about these pebbles and then you bring it into your scene and it's like holy shit like this these shapes are all wrong then you've you've made a mistake right oh yeah so it's a constant back and forth uh yeah try them as as fast as possible you know like once you have something like is this is this matching my scale of my scene and that kind of stuff now, just another question here that kind of goes back to your gradient maps. Uh, do you manually specify gradient points, or do you grab them from the reference? I, I always grab. So, so do you I, use I, like I the? Love that tool. Do you, are you uh, just sampling like the points? Do you use the like the pick gradient tool, or what, kind of what's your? Yeah, I use the pick the pick gradient. So like, okay. uh, I guess I can't really show that while here. Yeah, that kind, of, that kind of thing. Yeah, just do like a sample of a range from the reference. Yeah, and then like in in the gradient tool, you can you can change the precision here. So I usually grab it, you know, like fairly detailed, and they can go in and like you know, I don't like these, or you can you can kill a bunch of detail, or like oh, I want to darken all this and that kind of stuff. And okay, just looking for a couple more here. Uh, let's see. Uh, how do you organize the exposed parameters before and after? Uh, I think Gaetan and those guys at the at the algorithmic they they told me how they want the stuff organized. Uh, well, there's 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 tools in here. You know, you can put group names and stuff in here to to organize. I'm, I'm cur currently working on a tire and a rim generator and it has like a, a million parameters so that's really key to to group stuff well yeah i think that yeah that example you're just talking about will feed into the next question because uh this person's asking like uh how do you plan on exposing parameters is it something you plan before starting or is it exposed parameters along as you go so something like this tire example where it's going to be really complex yeah. how, you know what's your thought on that I think for, for the signature series, like essentially, you know, I broke down the whole, all the materials that I were going to make with, you know, one reference picture for each. And then, uh, I was just playing around with like different ideas of what, what kind of exposed parameters, uh, can we have for each of these materials to get, you know, a nice diversity and something that's actually useful for someone, you know, uh, wanting to use these. So I think, yeah, have the plan early on, but it's, it, since it's so easy to add in the end, like, you know, the wetness type stuff, that stuff is so easy to add. Uh, if you have stuff that affects your shape, you, you should, you could consider it early on, but I wouldn't like, in the early stages, it's, it's more important to get something that looks good and get your shapes right uh, over like worrying about like, Oh, if I do it this way, like I can add that parameter that I really wanted or something. It, it gets, you get like an artist block that way, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always find it's better to kind of, I don't know, if you think about left brain, right brain, like do the art creation part, you know, just let it kind of flow out of your head, right brain, and then after it's done, then go back and kind of put on your left brain side and think about more technical stuff, like yeah, exactly. parameters exposing and stuff. 
But then you, you have something that you like the shape of, and then you can, like, if you need to rebuild it, you, you know, like, how it needs to look. And you can rebuild it in a simpler way that works for your uh, idea of parameters. Is this true? All right, uh, Daniel. So one more question here that I think will kind of really kind of bring everything, uh, bring everything together here is, uh, what do you consider essential to making a realistic, convincing natural material? Oh, that's a pretty big question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. I mean, I, yeah, it's. I, I would think of it as like, I don't know. It, it, could you? What is there one specific thing that you you would find essential about that to, I guess, getting something to look realistic? Well, I think it needs to match. You know, match your reference in the end, right? It's like, I think you you, need, you just need to check back with your reference. Like, obviously, if you're making something, you know, alien or something weird, like it's all in your head, but if you're making something based on a photograph, like it, it should look like the photograph. Otherwise you're, you're not done or you failed or however you want to see it. Yeah. And then and I like, guess and that's true for like, this is obviously my, you know, my macro target in this instance, but you know, using reference for all the different, you know, layers and, you, know, you you go into this size and you know, have reference images that deals with that kind of stuff and you you compare those you know oh yeah like like one thing that's always helped me that i kind of think about is uh like i feel like kind of the height is is super important because i feel like if you can nail the height the details the shapes and forms pretty much like that's kind of like the way that you want to work and then everything else will fall into place after that would you agree yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree totally to that because, like, if your height doesn't match your reference, like, your AO is going to start looking weird, and you know, yeah, no, so totally, that's that's very true. That's why I always build, you know, I build all my graphs based on the height, and then you know, uh, diffuse and all the layers come after. But they're equally important, you know, like in a PBR workflow, you need to pay attention to all the details. Uh, and having something like mega scans or something like that, where you can you can kind of like uh, step through the different textures, you can see like okay, this is rock, and like what is the range of roughness for rock in something that's sourced or based on reality or or looks good, you know? And AO the same way, and but it, it all starts with the height. Yeah, you're totally right. Well, Daniel, I thank you very much. Uh, we're about 10 minutes over, uh, so we'll go ahead and kind of conclude this here. So, uh, Daniel, again, I just want to thank you very much for taking your time out of your busy schedule to do this webinar with us. Uh, yeah, I know we, a yeah, I know we had a lot of uh, issues to kind of get started. So, again, everyone, thank you, everyone here for joining us. I'm sorry we had uh, all these audio issues, but uh, we did have everything recorded, so it will be uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you missed anything, you can catch it from there. Uh, so again, Daniel, awesome. Uh, the materials that you created for Substance Source, uh, they're, they're seriously world class. I've had a great time myself just picking through them and looking at them. Um, it's very inspiring, the work that you do. And uh, yeah, we're real thankful that uh, you were able to work with us on this. So thanks a lot again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, just be on the lookout for more webinars. This is something that we really want to start doing more, uh, monthly webinars like this. And so, uh, yeah, just uh, you know, stay tuned to our Facebook page, Twitter, our newsletters, and things like that for more information on uh, you know, future webinars and things. So again, thanks, everybody, and we will see you next time.